everyone, and thank you for being with us today. My name is Sam Shinbaga. I head up the community development group here at the Atlanta Regional Commission. We have another great agenda for you today and a lineup of speakers. Uh, we are today going to be highlighting a particular part of a region, a part many of you know as uh, Airtropolis Atlanta. And that's uh, since, since its uh, formation in 2014, both the alliance that was created and the CIDs and the communities in the Airtropolis area have been working to create a new vision for Metro Atlanta Southside, uh, the community surrounding Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. So it, it, I, I'm proud to sort of say that the Airtropolis uh, model has both served as a national and international model, believe it or not, we have traveled internationally to speak about the work that's happened with the Airtropolis area uh, of coordinated planning and economic development that leverage uh, a critical regional asset, in this case, the airport. Uh, ARC, again, the, the, the way we have the agenda uh, today, we wanted to show you how ARC has been there throughout this journey up to this day, uh, part of our mission to create uh, through the region's plan and our uh, various uh, economic development strategies, a region that works for everyone. And so today you will be hearing from several speakers on the work that we have recently completed or have ongoing with the communities and the organization in the Airtropolis area. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we will also be hearing about some of the uh, fascinating results of our recently concluded Metro Atlanta Speaks survey. And so that's, a, that's an annual survey that the ARC has been conducting uh, since I believe 2013. And it's the largest of its kind in, in the region and uh, essentially offers a snapshot of what the residents are thinking uh, on a range of critical issues. So we obviously tweak that for uh, what 2020 presented to us. And so we're gonna have uh, some results to show you from that as well. Uh, with that, I am gonna turn it over first to Molly to go over a few housekeeping items and then I'll, I'll kick it off uh, onto next items. Molly? Yep, thanks, Sam. As always, I promise to be quick so we can get to the good stuff. Um, remember today uh, that you've got two ways to participate. Um, use that chat function throughout the presentation, submit questions, add comments. Um, don't, feel free, uh, don't feel that you need to wait for the presentation to end to use that. Um, time permitting, we'll ask you to raise your hands um, after each presentation if you'd rather participate verbally. Uh, we'll call on you and then you can unmute yourselves at that time. If you're having any technical difficulties um, during today's presentations, just log off and log back on. I know it sounds simplistic, but 99% uh, of the time it works. Um, if that doesn't work, try to download Zoom's desktop app. We find that that's a little bit more stable. Um, if you continue to have issues, uh, please submit a message to me through the chat function. I appear as the Atlanta Regional Commission or email me at mbogle at atlantaregional.org and I'll throw that in the chat after I'm done. Um, Next, we're going to actually ask you to respond to uh, a poll of uh, which sector you represent. I know we ask this each time, and we just kind of want to know where you're coming from. We've got about half of the attendees have responded. Just a few more seconds. We've got 38 out of 50 people have responded. So if those last few people could. All right, we've got 80% uh, voting. So we'll go ahead and end that poll. Looks like the public sector is the, the most represented here today with private at 29%, nonprofit at five and other at five. Right. Uh, thanks, Molly. Yeah. So I think now we are going to move into the agenda. And so again, for the agenda today, we're going to kick things off with the Metro Atlanta Speaks survey. 
summary and some of the key uh, key findings uh, that's that we're going to have, as you can see on your screen, our very own uh, Jim Skinner, uh, who is with our research and analytics group and has been doing a lot of the work and been speaking about a lot of the results that we have uh, seen out of the Metro Atlanta Speaks survey. And then we're going to follow it up with uh, a recently concluded study of the Airtropolis Atlanta land use analysis and recommendations that we did um, last fall and summer completed through our community development assistance program. And as part of that work, we did host a summit where uh, we had uh, Jeff Kosky with KB Advisory Group come and talk about the different land use types and the fiscal outcomes of some of those land use decisions. So we're gonna hear a little bit about that and then we're gonna round it off with uh, Aaron Thornson uh, with Gresham Smith and our own Daniel Studdard uh, speaking about the Airtropolis Atlanta Flight Freight Cluster Plan um, that was completed. So that is sort of the run of the show today. Like Molly said, please keep the questions coming and I'll try to pick as many of them up during the course of these presentations and uh, give it back to our speakers. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jim to kick us off with Metro Atlanta Speaks. Thank you, Sam, and, and thank you, Molly, for advancing these slides. We are gonna go fairly quickly through this. If we can have the next slide after the title slide, please. Sam's gone over a little bit of this, but just to give you a quick background, this whole initiative in Atlanta came from a link trip, a leadership network knowledge trip that we took in 2013. And this is the eighth year of the survey the goal is again, perceptions and attitudes. You know, you can ask people's factual knowledge, but that's not what we wanted to do here. We wanted to focus on, as it says there, recurring questions, bring in the timely topics like COVID this year and have a consistent set of demographic characteristics so we can get some richer information about people's perceptions and attitudes to maybe shape policy at the local level because this data is significant down to the county and city of Atlanta level. And that's what makes this survey so much different than the ones you may see in the media. Uh, again, this year, we had prior to this year done just a phone survey. It was getting too expensive because as a lot of you may know, only like a 6% response rate on phone surveys now. I don't even try to do it myself and I appreciate the art. But we went to a split online and phone survey this year and focused on the pandemic. And when you see the data that I'm gonna step through in a minute, remember this is August data collection. When possible, I'm gonna kind of inflect it a little bit with theories or national evidence as to how the results may have changed, but they're still very interesting. Next slide, please. These are the main conclusions. No shocker on the first thing, COVID-19 has changed everything. The new paradigm, whatever phrase we wanna use. The new normal, let's hope the new normal does not last. The biggest problem question, as many of you on the call may remember, has always been the question we've gotten the most traction from in terms of media and use at the local level, asking for about 10 topics. What do you as a resident of the region perceive as our biggest problem? That changed a lot this year, not surprisingly, with the onset of COVID. And related to that, very different perceptions on, on the part of our residents in terms of their health, in terms of the nature of their communities, in terms of their economic stability, and what we all know about inequity and inequality in our society was made more explicit with the you know, empirical evidence from this survey. And yet, we still have a positivity and a consistent positivity and an even increasing positivity about the future. Next slide. So just to step through some of that, over two thirds of us in August again, saw a major impact from COVID. I uh, think that some national surveys have this over 85, 90% now uh, for most demographics. So, but this was dramatic in August because it had surged from under 10% in March. Next slide. This breaks it down by the county level. Again, I said, that's the rich element of this data is that you can go to the county level and see from left to right there, the counties that have a relatively greater share of their respondents having a major or perceiving a major impact from COVID. 
goes down to the lowest level for Cherokee, a suburban county that's maybe not as impacted in terms of work and living environment by the onset of the virus. Higher in general, with the exception of Henry and the core counties. Next slide, please. We also asked about, do you know anyone that's had COVID? Obviously this was at basically nothing in March. It had surged up to close to 60%. Uh, and it's, it's over 80 nationally now, regrettably, in terms of the people that know someone that has had or is currently has COVID. Next slide. Again, the county level information from left to right here, the red bars indicate the share that do know somebody or have known somebody that's had COVID. And you can see that, that going up to the far right, you have Fayette and DeKalb County Fayette because of its higher age profile, a larger share knowing someone with COVID. DeKalb and Rockdale, fairly high minority populations. It's not surprising given the preponderance of the incidents on those populations that they have a higher share uh, knowing someone that's had COVID. Next slide, please. We've also break down most of these questions by race and age. Most of the slides aren't dealing with age here. Uh, as I've said, I've got a deck to share with you on that, but you'll see results you're not surprised at here. Higher shares of minority communities know someone that has had or currently has COVID. Lower shares of the white population. Next slide, please. Frequency wearing masks. We were somewhat heartened by the very large shares, even in August again, over 90% uh, in the core uh, central jurisdictions of the region that wore a mask all of the time or most of the time. That's the, the darker green shading on the chart. Uh, it dropped off only significantly in the suburban county of Cherokee, but still you're talking about 70 modeled that CDC recommended behavior uh, at least most of the time. Next slide. We also asked about, you know, responsivity of residents in terms of delaying the medical care, because obviously the risk went up when you went to your regular medical appointments, if you did not have to. And we were, um, again, uh, sort of pleasantly surprised that over 40% region-wide had delayed medical appointments uh, with regard to COVID. Of course, there's a cost to this in terms of preventative medicine that could have taken place otherwise, and yet it's avoiding infection rates. Higher in general, again, for core counties, lower in general for suburban counties or suburban areas. Next slide, please. Now that biggest problem, now that dramatic change that I was kind of setting you up for. In the previous seven years that we administered this survey, transportation, not surprisingly, was the biggest problem perceived by our residents. See that last year we had 28% at the top of the chart, 28% thinking transportation was the biggest problem. That dropped 18 percentage points this year to 10% because things like public health, you see that in the middle of the chart, was 7% last year up to 17%, an increase of 10 percentage points this year to the largest or the number one perceived problem, followed fairly closely by crime, which was pretty static although it ticked down from last year. And then after that, at fourth, we had a similar run up along with public health for race relations, an increase from 4% last year to 12% this year. And again, we'll delve further into some of the questions we asked uh, on race relations to get a better sense of why people thought that that surge or to explain that surge a little bit more. Next slide, please. Breaking it down by county, as you see, the, the uh, blue bars indicate those, the share that perceive public health as the number one problem. Again, region-wide, that was the largest problem at almost 17%. So you see that most of our jurisdictions, a majority do rank public health number one. But if you look at the rectangle down there, you'll see in the cab, we have the distinction that crimes outstripped both uh, public health and the economy as the biggest problem. Uh, with the circles, the red circles that you see right below DeKalb, Clayton and Douglas saw the economy as the biggest problem. So you get these nuances at the county level. And in the triangle at the bottom, you'll see that Henry actually had race relations, which is number four region-wide. Henry had it as their number one biggest problem. 
And it's really not surprising given, as a lot of you guys know very well, the demographic uh, turnover, the demographic stress and transition that's occurring in Henry County. Next slide, please. We also looked at this by age really quickly. Very interesting distinctions for the 65 plus group that has been driving the number two or number one rankings of crime region wide for our biggest problem because they had by far the largest share of any age group thinking crime was the number one biggest problem. For the 18 to 34, which includes the millennial group aging on a little bit, we saw you know, more progressive, if you want, classification of the biggest problem. Race relations was far more likely to be rated the biggest problem by that group, uh, as well as issues such as uh, uh, educational services and you know, public services. Uh, and if you look at the red circles there, you'll see that the professional, the core professional demographic of 35 to 49, you had uh, them rating high, relatively higher for public health and economy. And let's look at economy a little bit more in the next slide, please, Molly. Uh, we asked a question about uh, the characteristics or the nature of the economic impact on our respondents. And with this question, what you got to focus on is that Options one through five there, people could select all of them if they wanted. As far as a single response, it was only possible to say none of those above negative characteristics with the exception of telecommuting could happen to me. So that's to keep in mind. Next slide, please. You'll see here that an overwhelming share for every jurisdiction really, even Douglas at over two thirds, an overwhelming share had one or more negative things for the most part happened to them as a result of COVID. Uh, with uh, it's over 75%, in fact, for all but two of our jurisdictions. So, next slide, please. This is an interesting uh, parallel or discrepancy here that we noticed. Um, about 30% of, of most jurisdictions here, or well over a quarter. Uh, experience the layoff, selected that as an option on that menu that we looked at earlier. Uh, it was only below 15% of uh, responses received in the case of Cobb County. If we flip to the next slide, what's very interesting is that Cobb had the greatest likelihood for employees of being able to work from home. So that's kind of a not surprising parallel, sort of confirms the less likelihood of layoffs in that county versus or complemented by the greater likelihood that Cobb residents were working in industries where they were allowed to or able to work from home. And if you notice Clayton down there at the bottom of that chart, Clayton ranked the highest in terms of the county residents experiencing layoffs. It is the lowest correspondingly in terms of the percentage of respondents working in essential or even uh, critical industries where they could not access teleworking possibilities. Next chart, please. Looking at this by race is really even more fascinating. If you look at that top cluster of bars, sorry, back one slide. If you look at that top cluster of, of, of slides, you'll, charts, you'll see over a fifth of the white population had no negative impacts from the pandemic in terms of the work atmosphere. Whereas you're looking at about 15% uh, of the uh, black population, well, actually 13% of the black population that had those negative impacts. You look at work from home down there in the middle of the chart, much higher share of white respondents, the red bar at nearly four in 10, drops down to three in 10 for the black population. And down at the bottom, laid off, terminated or furloughed, much higher share three in 10 of the black population laid off, terminated or furloughed. And I uh, can't see it right now, but a lower share for the white population uh, that, that experienced that very negative impact. Next slide, please. Again, at the county level, we delved a little further into the nature of those negative uh, economic impacts when they occurred. Look at housing burden here. And we saw that over 30%, region-wide were less than very confident in making their next mortgage or rent payment. We've got some updated information from the 
census household poll survey that indicates that these shares have not gotten better, certainly as time has gone on, and even as programmatic solutions to defer payments have presented themselves. And you see there's a large range there, and a range that kind of corresponds, ironically enough, or not surprisingly enough, to the ability of people to telework to the consistency with which they held their jobs. Next slide, please. Looking at that by race, much higher shares of non-white population were less than very confident in their ability to make that next payment. Next slide. Looking at a $400 emergency. Again, this question came up to us uh, from a federal survey that's asked this for about 10 years running now. Our results here are a little bit consistent with uh, national shares because what we're looking at is about only about 50% of people that could pay an expense like that straight out with cash, check, or debit without having to put it on a credit card or without, in the case of about 20 to 25% in some of our jurisdictions, not being able to pay that expense at all. And you see with our higher income counties, like your Fayette, Henry, Cherokee, the suburban areas, much higher shares able to pay the expenses straight out compared to counties with higher poverty rates at the bottom of the chart. Next slide, please. Looking at that by ethnicity, again, the same pattern. Higher shares of difficulty paying it straight out with cash, check, or debit for non-white communities and population groups. Next slide, please. Looking at food bank, kind of the most uh, direct and uh, challenging impact of a, of a negative economic shock. We see approaching one in five respondents having to access a food bank between the March and August period, uh, ranging all the way from almost one in three for the city of Atlanta, down to under one in 10 in the case of the wealthier again, suburban counties like Cherokee and Fayette. Next slide, please. Again, the race ethnicity, the same distinctions that you've seen with the confidence in the ability to pay the mortgage in the $400 emergency, almost twice the percentage share having, that, having to access a food bank in the case of black and Latino populations compared to the white population. Next slide, please. And here we've asked, delve more into that race relations phenomenon where you saw that share of people judging that the biggest problem shoot up from 4% in 2019 to 12% in 2020. Wide variation here, which is very interesting in the share of respondents at the county level that strongly agree or agree. Those are the darker, well, actually the green shading there, strongly agree or agree that discrimination against black people specifically is a problem. Ranging all the way from a low, but still a fairly high share of almost 60% in Cherokee County up to approaching 90% perceiving uh, discrimination against Blacks as a problem in DeKalb and the city of Atlanta with a higher share of minority populations compared to Fayette and Cherokee, which have a lower share, relatively speaking. Interesting, Henry's results are on the lower end of residents perceiving a problem with discrimination against the Black population, and yet you have a rapidly diversifying population there. That's something that, that could be indicative of that demographic change being very quick and challenging to that, those respondents there. Next slide, please. Looking at that breakdown, not surprising, of course, the minority populations themselves more attuned to the discrimination that they are suffering, as opposed to about two in three of the white population that agree or strongly agree with that assessment. Next slide, please. This is an interesting and somewhat complicated question, but very revealing. This asks the respondents to relatively assess black wealth versus the typical white wealth with the baseline of a white family at 100 units. Next slide, please. And what you see here is that the actual ratio of black wealth, black dollars of wealth to white dollars of wealth is one to 10. And what you see is a vast overestimate in every one of our jurisdictions 
of that ratio, meaning that every one of our jurisdictions thought that black wealth was closer to white wealth than it actually is. So this goes to, sorry, yeah, sorry, back two slides, sorry. This goes to uh, just a lack of knowledge that really, you know, informs the challenge that we're going to have in terms of reducing the level of discrimination we've got in our region. Next slide, please. We also asked, and this is pertinent to race relations too, obviously, do you think that it's better for police to respond in a, in a uh, not police to respond, but other agencies like social services to respond to police calls that don't require it? Again, very large uh, ratios, very large difference in the ratios. Much higher shares of our suburban communities believe that police should respond to all calls versus far lower shares in our core communities that maybe have experienced the need for more nuance in those reactions of the police to the community. Next slide, please. And again, those distinctions do play out as do other questions at a racial level white populations much more likely to want police to respond to all calls than minority populations. Next slide, please. We all are asked about the future and this is the silver lining in a lot of the challenges that the other data has presented. What we've got here is higher rates of optimism in counties that have uh, higher poverty rates and lower income levels with the exception of Cobb County there whereas we have lower optimism for the most part in suburban counties, with the exception there of DeKalb, slightly higher income levels and lower poverty rates. Next slide, please. And looking at this, this is more pronounced really when you look at the racial categories, more optimism in minority communities for the next three to four years than in the white community, which is a you know, counterintuitive result. This is held for every year we've done the survey. It's very interesting. Next slide, please. This is just a review of things we're gonna do next. We've already started to do 33 degree north. That's our blog. You'll see the URL momentarily. Done blog posts that delve into topic areas for Metro Atlanta Speaks. We're gonna do some regression analysis to tease out why people answer which ways. We'd be glad to do more outreach. If you and your jurisdiction want a presentation or certainly want detailed county level information for your area, let me know. We're gonna be starting up, we've already started up on the 2021 survey, doing an RFP selection. If you have an idea for a question you'd like to ask, no guarantees, but shoot it over our way. We're gonna to try to work in housing questions, maybe some more workforce questions. We're targeting August again for the uh, month of the survey and results in September. Next slide, please. Real quickly, three URLs for more information. This, uh, this page is on the ARC website. Next slide, please. One of the best resources at the URL at the top is our Tableau dashboard, which is built by one of our terrific uh, analysts uh, and coders. Uh, hey Song Tong has done a great job with this. Next slide, please. And also our 33 degree north, there's the URL for that, the Metro Atlanta Speaks Arena, housing and security down there at the bottom left, just published a few days ago. And that's all I had today. If there's time for any questions, be glad to take them, or I know it's a lot of information, feel free to email me. Uh, if you have any questions later on, these sites are obviously available for review. And on that ARC webpage, you have much larger slide decks. Uh, if you have have a yen to check those. Thanks, Jim. That again, I, I, I know I have seen this presentation a few times, but every time I look at it, I feel like I have so many different emotions that are tied throughout the course of the presentation. It's, it's fascinating, disappointing, shocking, yeah, yeah. surprising, hopeful, all the things rolled into the same presentation. Uh, because in, in some ways you start feeling hopeful about the fact that there is a incentive sense of awareness and yeah, a need yeah. to address the the you know the the discrimination and and the racial injustice issues that were were faced as a region but also at the same time the data also shows us that there's a lot of work ahead of us and it's pretty daunting yeah, yeah. it is a systemic okay. issue uh that that has played out uh very clearly in this pandemic 
So I, I don't know, I, I, I think I heard somewhere, read this morning somewhere about how life expectancy, like one of those metrics right. for, for, the, for, for nationally dropped by one year, but for the, uh, the black population dropped by 2.7 years. Right, right. The yeah, Latino yeah. population dropped by like 1.9 years. It's just yeah, almost a long time to hire higher over that population. Yep, yep. Right. Yeah. You, know, you know, it was, it was already, already low, low, obviously, because, because of other, other uh, comorbid as they say. say. And, and, and COVID, COVID was like with them and probably just made them better. Right. Well, uh, again, uh, there's again a lot of folks saying here about how they enjoyed it. This was a lot of great information. So thank you, Jim. And Thank like, you know, if there's questions, please do reach out to Jim or, or you can go to the website. So absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. All right. With that, uh, we are going to move to the next item on our agenda. And uh, that is we're going to kick things off with the Aertropolis Atlanta work that we've done. Um, I, I believe we're going to change it up a little bit, but I'm going to have Carrie kick it off and then uh, turn it over to Jeff. Uh, Carrie, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to see everyone virtually. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, again, my name is Carrie Stevens, and I'm a planning administrator here at the Atlanta Regional Commission. And today I'll be speaking about the recently completed land use analysis and recommendations report which is a Community Development Assistance Program project, also known as CDAP, which is staffed by the ARC in partnering with the Airtropolis Atlanta Alliance. Um, as part of this project, we had a half-day summit in November, of which we had Jeff Kosky with KB Advisory Group to discuss the fiscal outcomes of various real estate types, um, which were in partnership with deciding some of these land use recommendations. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeff uh, and allow him to do his presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Um, good to be with you all again. I know we've been together before, um, and it's always a pleasure. But it's not a pleasure following Jim. What a fascinating group of data um, that 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 survey was. Wow. Um, really, really taking time to process that. But Moving forward here, um, let's let's dig into the Aerotropolis area and think a little bit about what's happening there. Uh, sorry for the uh, obnoxious branding behind me. Um, you may or may not be aware we've re we've uh, refreshed our name, and so I'm just following the playbook. Um, they tell me what to do in terms of how to go about this. So here we are. Um, but again, we do. You've you've heard me talk about housing in the past, and that um, is certainly one piece of our practice. But there are other pieces and. Part of this is uh, fiscal analysis in the Atlanta region that we do. And uh, that's what I'll be talking about today, particularly in the uh, Aerotropolis area. Next slide, please. So uh, just kind of quickly to give you a, a sense of where we're going here, uh, I'm just gonna introduce you a little bit to this, this work that I reference our fiscal analysis. More than anything, just to establish some credibility here um, that you know that you know, kind of where our head is. And then we'll talk about some of the analysis that we've done um, through the years um, in regard to, to um, the fiscal uh, impacts of various land use types throughout the region, um, just to kind of provide some context. And then we'll get deep into what we're calling the near West air cities, um, uh, talking about the development that has occurred there over the past decade, and then the fiscal outcomes of that development. So buckle up, we've got about 20 minutes and uh, happy to take um, um, any sort of questions that you have either through the chat that we can address or um, email, talk, call, you know, however we need to talk down the road. Next slide, please. So again, just quickly, um, a bit of an advertisement for our firm, but also just so you know, um, that we do spend a lot of time assessing uh, fiscal outcomes of various municipalities and land uses um, throughout the region. Um, we get involved in economic and fiscal impact analyses for large projects, for large areas, uh, including, for example, the Cumberland area, also Gwinnett Place CID, see out there, Joe. Um, um, so many CIDs throughout the, the region, we've done impact analyses, as well as putting together redevelopment plans for tax allocation districts, which 
uh, require us in when we put those together to dig deeply into, um, and again, the fiscal impacts of various development types, which we're talking about here. So um, that's just a bit of a background where we're coming from. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start here in the Northern part of the region in Cherokee County. And again, obviously we're getting down to the, the South side and the Aerotropolis area, but I wanna, I, I always like, this is what I call one of our greatest hits in some analysis that we've done. And again, I mean, this is mostly based on public data, public information. So it's not like we're inventing this, uh, you know, the data, uh, it's, it's analysis that you can do on your own, but really taking a look at um, two different development types. Right, we've got the downtown area, downtown Woodstock, which you know, 25 years ago was um, a very sleepy, quiet little railroad downtown. Um, and as and Woodstock decided to make an effort to really develop their downtown, the 20 uh, 20 ish, 20 25 acres of property downtown that they decided to to focus on creating a walkable mixed use area and and provide opportunities for retail, residential, office, and um, and do it in a, in a way that is for a suburban area, pretty dense, right? And so that is one economic development strategy among you know, other types of strategy. It is an economic development strategy to pursue that type of development typology. They also, they being Woodstock, right? Just around the corner, around the same time that they were beginning to develop the downtown um, also, um, uh, pursued and and um, and um, accepted and welcomed the outlet shops of Atlanta, literally just around the corner, just two miles apart from each other. And this is again another type of what we might call economic development: getting the big single-use box, lots of retail action happening along the highway. So again, this is kind of a setup, right? We've got we've got the compact walkable mixed use. We've got the big single use out by the interstate on almost twice as much property. Next slide, please. And so the question is, from a fiscal standpoint, particularly when we're talking about property taxes, because we know municipalities um, in Georgia are largely funded through property taxes, which one of these is the quote unquote winner? Now, again, these are not mutually exclusive. They both succeed, particularly when we're not in the middle of a pandemic. Um, they, they, they both serve a purpose in the community. So we're not trying to say one is necessarily the, the way you should go about your business if you are a city. Again, you can, you can pursue both of them. Woodstock has done it successfully. But our question that we're asking is not which you should necessarily pursue, but when you do, what are the outcomes? What are the fiscal outcomes? What does it mean to have a walkable mixed use downtown? What does it mean to have the outlet shops out by the highway or a single use um, on a large parcel out by the highway for the uh, property tax digest? And again, in that very narrow um, look at things, the, the more compact walkable downtown Woodstock is far and away the winner when it comes to the, um, the fiscal impacts, particularly property tax impacts, and particularly not just the overall value, but that value per acre. And that you can see that the value, the tax assessed value in downtown Woodstock is nearing $4 million an acre. And so those are, those are big values. So that's, that's urban type values, you know, values you might see in the central perimeter area, for example, for, for high impact sites. And so that is some amazing performance in terms of um, uh, the, the land uses on those 20 acres in downtown Woodstock are performing wonderfully. The outlet shops, you can see here from a property tax standpoint, a uh, significant 10 times, over 10 times lower on a per acre basis on a property tax um, uh, performance basis. Now, granted, that's almost 400 square feet of retail. And again, when it's humming and you, you, know, you can see all the cars in the parking lot there, it's humming a lot. When we're not in a pandemic, there's a lot of sales taxes that are being collected out of that too. So not trying to, um, to ignore that fact, but just thinking about your property tax digest, the compact walkable model is far and away um, a, a winner when it comes to um, fiscal performance, particularly on a per acre basis. Next slide, please. So again, applying that idea of where is the highest performing real estate in your city, right? And so in the city of Atlanta, 
we know that our central business district is kind of strung out along the Peachtree corridor, right? From Buckhead all the way down to downtown again. And so you can see on this map, this is work we did um, last year, um, the, the orange uh, parcels of land, that's what we're considering the Peachtree corridor, which is basically three CIDs, Buckhead, Midtown and downtown with a little bit of Brook, Brookwood um, there in the middle. But basically when you, when you add it up on less than 4% of the land uh, in the city of Atlanta, the city collects a third of its overall tax property tax digest from just those parcels in orange. The verticality of those parcels is is the value per acre calculation, right? And so, and the part and the 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 shape is the shape of the parcel, not necessarily the building on it. But again, this comes back to density, right? And and, and that the idea that you that the city of Atlanta functions because there is a a central business district, an opportunity for density a place where you can get high value um, per, on a per acre basis. Again, and then you can see the rest of the city is pretty flat, right? And so again, this is a strategy, right? That, that is, you know, I mean, it wasn't conceived of 100, 200 years ago that we need to do this for, for the fiscal performance of our city. But as it turns out, having a central business district and even, even a strung out you know, disconnected central business district like we have in Atlanta, you still end up with a, a section of your city that functions um, much higher on a per acre property tax basis than the rest of the city and allows you to keep the densities low elsewhere because they are, because they are concentrated in the core. Next slide, please. And so again, just kind of focusing in on Midtown and Midtown CID is bounded um, in red there. You can see P Piedmont Park uh, just to uh, just to the east, the, the map has been turned around. But again, in, in these numbers are astounding. On less than 1% of the land, right, the Midtown CID, less than 1% of the land of the city of Atlanta, um, uh, the city collects 10% of its property taxes from that area. So very high performing um, areas. And again, the, the fact is it comes down to density, right? This, this is uh, allowed to happen, if you will, because of the, uh, the density that is allowed in these areas. And that uh, enhances the fiscal performance of the property of the dirt underneath the buildings, as they would say. Next slide, please. And just quickly, um, thinking about the other side of the coin. So that's the, that's, that's the revenue side, right? That the, that the denser areas um, function uh, on a per acre basis, much at a higher level um, but what about the cost side, right? Bottom line, without getting into this too much, is that um, Smart Growth America did a study thinking about where are, where are the um, most efficient places to do new development? And, you know, fast forward to the, to the answer. The answer is downtown. And the, and the question then is why, why downtown? Next slide, please. The answer is service delivery costs. So not only are your core areas, your walkable, compact, more dense areas, higher performing uh, from a property tax basis, but they also are easier to deliver um, services to because you, you don't have to string out the pipes and the wires and the, 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 um, the path to the fire for the fire trucks out on the outskirts of town. You can do it in a dense manner and a denser manner. And so both the revenue that is being collected in these areas and the costs are um, um, ensure that these core areas are more um, higher performing um, areas. All right, next slide, please. So that's kind of the setup for you. That's kind of gives you an idea of the, some of the thinking that we've done, our greatest hits through the years and, and, and the philosophy that we have in that. You can have both, right? Why not both as the mean goes? in terms of development, right? Not all of your development in your city is going to be higher density, compact, walkable, et cetera, et cetera. However, the idea is you, get, you should, our recommendation is you should have that somewhere because it's going to drive development possibilities elsewhere. So we wanted to take a look at Aerotropolis area and, de and determine what's, what's it look like there, right? This is an emerging area. We know there's been a lot of industrial development, a lot of that single use, um, single use out near the interstate type of, you know, not so many outlet malls, but, but lots of things that look like outlet malls, million square feet, um, warehouse and distribution centers that are being built. 
what has that meant for the fiscal performance of these areas? And so we've combined East Point College Park and really only the Fulton portion of College Park and Union City as a sample set, if you will, of the South Side. And we call this area, we made this up, Near West Air Cities, just as a, just we, again, we made up the name in order to give ourselves a sample set of what's happening in the Aerotropolis area. How has it been performing? Next slide, please. First, we wanted to look at the development that has occurred. And again, I think it's no surprise to anyone who has paid attention to the news or has driven you know, by the airport and, and, and southward that there's a lot of warehouse distribution, in, in distribution industrial development that has occurred on the south side. And in fact, in, in our near west air cities, you can see that in the past 10 years, they, that area has added, right, um, over 6 million, almost 7 million square feet of industrial space. And again, it's not all industrial manufacturing, which I'll come back to. It's largely warehouse and um, logistics facilities. 5% annual growth over a decade is super sporty. Um, that's a technical term. Um, you know, 5% annual growth is huge. The, the population growth in the region, which is one of the fastest growing regions in the nation, is 2%, you know. And so to get 5% annual growth on industrial space over the course of a decade is impressive. Next slide, please. The other land use types have not grown nearly as much, right? And we'll kind of go quickly, but on the retail side, less than 1% annual growth. Next slide, please. On the multifamily um, units, uh, taking a look at that over the past decade, very, very little additions really, less than 1,000. Uh, uh, new units over 10 years, so less than half of 1% annual growth. Next slide, please. Then thinking about, we, you know, we don't have the same kind of commercial real estate data as we would have um, on the for sale single family side, but we're just looking at total housing units, you know, really very few added additional units um, in those three cities. And again, net, you know, net from 2010 to 2012, there may have been more added, but some have come offline. So less than less than half a percent annual growth there on the um, overall housing unit count side. Next slide, please. And so this is a summary again. Um, and again, this I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, at least you know in terms of the overall results of this, but maybe the scale in which the industrial has grown and the housing side has not grown nearly as much. Uh, again, 10 times less growth, if you will. Um, and retail um, also not growing as much. So again, not trying to make any judgments on this. It, it is what it is. This is this is how the the near West Air cities have grown over the past decade. And so it's it's it is what it is, as they say. But then the question is, well, what does that mean for the um, tax digest, particularly the property tax digest in this area? Where has this left us? This ten years worth of growth. And then what are the implications of that and how might the next 10 years look? So next slide, please. So this is, this is a look at the overall tax digest and I need to kind of stop here for just a second and say a few things. First of all, my team tells me that if you've got seven, if you've got more than six lines on a line chart, there's too many, right? And if you've seen my presentation before, you've heard me, you've heard me say this, but we've got seven on this. So I'm one line over the line um, so it's a little bit confusing. So it takes a minute to kind of wrap your head around. Um, but nevertheless, you can see what's happened. The overall gross digest is that blue dotted line at the top. And so uh, particularly if you start looking at it from 2014 on, right? So we've kind of, by 2014, we kind of put the recession behind us, the Great Recession, and we started moving, moving the region forward um, with, with haste. Um, and you can see the south side, at least the near west air cities that we've uh, that we've created here, um, grew tremendously. The property tax base and where did that growth come from? You can see what's where's you know the the solid lines. Which ones are accelerating the most, particularly since 2014? It's the commercial digest. And again, the data we you know we're dealing with multiple data sets here. And so this data, when we're talking about commercial includes warehousing and logistics facilities, right? Largely what's been built, what was called industrial on those previous slides. But for this data, industrial only includes the manufacturing facilities, right? So only the manufacturing facilities. So that's the green line. 
the the red line is mostly driven by that 51% growth over the net over the last decade from the um, what was called industrial but is called com, uh, commercial here and so you can see driving what's driving this growth in the property di tax digest and and again i think you know anyone working in municipal government would would um, agree that this type of digest growth is is good for a city um, and, and allows you to do things that, that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Also pointing out the residential digest starting to grow there over the past three or four years. Again, a lot of that, you know, a lot of the, um, uh, not only new units, but also increases in value of units. Now, again, you know, that, that could uh, bring up ideas of uh, gentrification and displacement and that, that residential digest is going higher. It makes it more difficult. For, for lower income households to pay their taxes, property taxes. But the lens we're using here is municip municipal finances. And so this increase in residential digest is obviously good for the bottom line for the near West air cities. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the upshot of that real estate data that we just looked at. Next slide, please. And so again, now, so the question is, okay, here we are, and 2019 is the most recent data that we were able to use when we put this together. But then the question is, is this good, right? So we've seen this kind of growth, but how does this compare in terms of the land use mix, right? Because that's really what we're trying to get at here is, where does this leave us? Where is our digest, right? After this 10 years of dramatic commercial growth, um, you know, driven by warehouse and logistics, single use, you know, where does that leave us? in terms of our tax digest. And you can see over on the left, how these near West air cities compare just to, as points of comparison, the overall digest for Fulton County, the overall digest for Clayton County, just again, as, to use as points of comparison. The bar charts over on the right, this is sort of the evolution of the tax digest over the past 10 years in those near West air cities. So again, the commercial digest, right, grew tremendously. And then actually as a proportion of the overall digest has dropped a bit because you can see the residential digest has gone up. And again, this actually could speak to a lot of things. This could speak to potentially our housing crisis. We're not building enough housing, which is driving up uh, the values of homes. But on the other hand, it's also getting us closer in these near West air cities, getting, the, getting us closer to what the digest might look, you know, what the what the comparable digest looks like overall in Fulton and Clayton. So, so it's kind of interesting to see where this has left us. And again, you can see that 10 years of growth on the commercial side, right, is now at 56%, but it was only 48% um, 10 years ago. Next slide, please. So this is this is the growth that has occurred. And you can see that the commercial digest has nearly doubled, right? You get up to 100%, you've doubled your digest. That's amazing. Um, and then you can kind of see what what else is driving it. And again, um, from a from a percent growth perspective, right, the debt the residential digest has not grown as much. Although again, we saw we saw how it is picking up um, over the past few years. Next slide, please. So here is um, the value per acre calculation, right? So back if you remember, we started in Woodstock and we were talking about value per acre. And interestingly enough, right? So if, if that commercial digest is being driven by that single use out you know, near the interstate, um, using that example, um, e even those large million square feet boxes are actually driving up the per unit, per um, value per acre on the, in the commercial digest. So that was really a surprise to me to see that, that, that um, the value per acre increase as much given those single use boxes because of what we know from other work. And then you can again, see the residential digest growing on a per acre basis. Um, but again, the question is where do we go from here, right? And so I would suggest that potentially given this 10 years of growth, if we were to grow that much again on the commercial digest side, if it was all the growth came from those large boxes, um, I don't believe you would see quite as much growth on the on the per acre basis, right? And again, pursuing for for these areas to for these cities um, on the south side to continue to pursue to strengthen their core, to <clears throat> to enhance the mix of uses to get additional residential in their cores is only going to continue to drive up the value per acre 
on the residential side as well. And potentially we'll, um, we'll continue to drive up the per acre basis um, for the commercial digest as well, because presumably there would be some uh, corresponding commercial development in, in the downtown cores as well. Next slide. So again, as we look at this, uh, what does all this mean? Uh, one thing is it, it makes this, these near West air cities unique, right? Because in most places throughout this, throughout our region, particularly the suburban um, places, but even in places like city of Decatur, they are very much dependent upon, sing, upon their single family homeowners to drive the, the res, to drive the overall property tax digest. And that, as you saw from those numbers, is not the case in these near West air cities. So, so that, that gives them sort of a, a different perspective on the world um, as they think about how to continue to grow their tax base to provide um, services for the citizens. The thing that I think is important is that while I think the, the, I think the numbers are telling us that this growth um, in the commercial digest has been good. It, obviously, it's not just about the property tax um, uh, performance. Um, you know, that's the only narrow lens we're looking at, but there's jobs that are being created, you know, knock on multiplier effects for the economy. Um, and then also, you know, there's potentially a downside. But the big thing that I would say, again, using our narrow lens that we're look, using here is to say that, you know, over the next 10 years, we would, we would like to see um, a diversification of development, right? And that you've got, if you put all your eggs in one basket, you become fragile. So a strategy is to say, again, all the way back to that Woodstock example, look, why not both? You know, we need to strengthen our downtowns. We need to establish our cores. We need to have dense mixed use walkable areas to enhance our property tax basis on a per, uh, on a, you know, in a per acre calculation. But the, but the large developments, the big box developments are also driving our tax base now again, where is that tipping point on the service cost side of things? And that's really the big question. What does this look like on the, on the cost side and the net fiscal impact, which is not something that we did in this study, but I think that would be the next, the next big question. What about, um, what about the cost side? And then as Jared says in the chat, what about sales taxes? Sales taxes are important. Again, that's not factored into this analysis, but to look at the overall holistic picture, we would need to look at sales taxes as well. So uh, next slide, I think that's it. Um, that's it. So let's see, we've got some um, um, folks with questions out there. I've got to jump off real quick. Um, but if I need to follow up, if anybody wants to talk more about this, you've got my, uh, you've got my contact info here. I'm being more than happy to, to dig into this. Again, acknowledging that this is a very narrow, narrow, um, lens that we're using, but I think there's a lot to take away from this. And I think there's a lot that this is could be the basis of a much further, uh, deeper explanation that takes into account sales taxes, that takes into account the, the cost side for net fiscal impacts, et cetera. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm reading Sam's question. Does this on the flip side mean that commercial is occurring in natural areas or greenfield sites that have high value in terms of quality of life, but not I mean, I think, I think that, yes, I mean, that's another important calculation, Sam, is that, you know, quality, ultimately, this is all about quality of life, right? How do you deliver the revenue to the city coffers to provide quality of life for its citizens? I mean, that's, that's the job of the city and, and the county is, is it's all about quality of life. And is this making it better? I mean, I think that's a political and, and community a driven question that needs to be answered. But again, you know, not necessarily taken into account here. Um, and again, Rebecca's question about runway protection zones, very good point. Again, this is just a sliver of the of the overall tax base um, in the in the Aerotropolis area. And it's also, you know, it's a it's a, a, a sample set. So the that particular sample set absolutely is impacted by the FAA guidelines. So again, I mean, there are nuances to this that I wasn't able to really cover today, but these are, these are wonderful questions. And really all of that should continue to be kind of poked and prodded at um, to, to continue to really understand what's driving the municipal tax base in the Aerotropolis area. So with that, I am going to uh, bid you adieu. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. Um, it's been a pleasure and I hope to speak with you all um, again in the near future. Thank you.
Carrie, are you, are, are, am I turning it over to you now? Um, but I, I wanted to thank Jeff because that was fascinating. And I know there was a lot of great information in there. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, this, again, in, in the context of the work that we did, which is what Carrie's going to talk about, was us to uh, engage the elected leadership in a conversation about how do we make development decisions. And everything is a balance. Everything has its pros and cons. But at the end of the day, how do we how do we look at the future development patterns of this subregion and weigh the pros and the cons? Uh, this this was one lens that we used to look at that work. So, um, uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and I also want to um, thank Jeff um, uh, for his analysis. Um, it gave us a great foundation to evaluate the different land use types that we're going to be discussing in the land use analysis and recommendations report uh, and the impact on the tax base design and general livability in the Aerotropolis area. So uh, kind of as Sam said with Jim's presentation, I've seen Jeff's presentation now three times and every time I see it, it highlights new and different information. So um, again, thank you, Jeff. So next slide, please. I just want to start off with a little bit of background. Um, I think most of you are aware, but the Airtropolis Atlanta, um, also known as the Alliance, um, was created in 2014 and accomplishes its goals through a comprehensive approach to planning and development that includes initiatives to enhance economic development, regional planning projects, and workforce training and development. Next slide, please. And before I dive into the report specifically and the findings and recommendations, I wanted to review how we got here uh, and the importance of the prior efforts which led to this study. Uh, ARC funded the first of its kind strategy for the Atlanta area that leverages the Atlanta airport as a major asset to drive economic investment known as the Airtropolis Atlanta Blueprint. And as you can see here, it was a $200,000 study, was completed and adopted in 2016 and is the founding framework for the Airtropolis Alliance organization. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see the guiding principles and goals from the Airtropolis Blueprint. I will read these because they do provide the foundation for the Alliance and their partners activities from their adoption in 2016 all the way to the present. Um, the guiding principles are a win for one is a win for all, maintain inspired leadership, target our efforts, Leverage what makes Airtropolis special. And success is a public-private effort. And the goals, improved perception of the area, increased economic investment, a true partnership, and advancing our catalyst sites. Next slide, please. The importance of formulating the guiding principles and goals and the Airtropolis Atlanta blueprint itself is that the Airtropolis area includes 13 cities two counties, and the world's busiest airport. It is a very complex area with many partners to engage with. The principles, goals, and five-year work plan, which will be discussed in a minute, uh, align these key partners and helped move the area forward with collaboration and cooperation in mind. Next slide, please. To this end, you can see the five-year work plan from Blueprint 1.0. Uh, the great part about this slide is that you can see uh, in the status 2020 category, um, which is kind of the, the middle with the blue and, and green boxes, uh, you can see that there's so much progress that has been made, uh, things that have been completed and things that are ongoing. Uh, as you can see under the land use and urban form, many of the action items are ongoing. Uh, the audit local land use policies for efficacy and enabling blueprint is a key project to moving forward. Next slide, please. Over the next few slides, I will highlight some of the key successes, including what you can see here, which is the development of the Greenway concept. Next slide, please. The identification of catalytic sites. Next slide, please. And all the amazing planning and development that has occurred since 2016. If we think about it, it's only five years. Uh, so there's a variety of different planning studies, but also a redevelopment of Fort Gallum, um, the BW Training Center, Six West College Park groundbreaking, and all the other items that are on this list. So they have made amazing progress. Next slide, please. 
So now we're going to dive into the land use analysis and recommendations report, which was based on the action item from the five year action plan. Next slide, please. The report built off the successes of Blueprint and will assist the Alliance to better coordinate land use and economic development goals across jurisdictional lines. It also prepares the Alliance to embark on its next strategic and visioning process, Airtropolis Blueprint 2.0. Work on this plan was conducted between August of 2019 and November of 2020. Next slide, please. The process in general focused on the inventory of existing conditions, land use mapping with input from stakeholders at a number of different meetings, which included regional speakers discussing successful developments. The team worked on a framework, key goals and unique strengths and weaknesses of the area and defined priority areas. Challenges and opportunities were developed for each of the priority areas, which we will not have time to get into today, uh, but we will review the overall recommendations developed for the general area and a summit was held to outline and further have a discussion. Um, and we'll put that um, full report in the chat so you can review all the, um, all the other information associated with the priority areas. Next slide, please. And here you can see a tool that we used, um, which is a general future land use map. Um, this was developed by compiling data and land use types were coded into common designations that were consistent across jurisdiction. Uh, it's important to note that the map provides an overview of desired land use pattern and the scale of land uses within the study area to show a clear picture of land uses in the area. Uh, the map was not intended to inform or prescribe local level policy. It's just a tool to understand uh, the goals across Aerotropolis jurisdictions. Uh, the project team utilized the general map, stakeholder input, and aerials to determine areas where land uses coordinate and where they are incompatible. Um, mixed use and industrial mixed, mixed use designations were particularly problematic because of the lack of cohesive definitions and thus scale and interaction with other land uses, such as residential, causing conflicts. Next slide, please. And this slide kind of goes into what Jeff was talking about just a little bit. Um, this chart, as you can see, indicates that 17% of the area is industrial uh, and 8.7% is mixed use. Uh, the industrial related category uh, can include business parks, warehouse distribution and other uses. Um, again, this is not consistent across jurisdictions in the region. Um, their relationship to others is not consistent either. Um, an interesting note is 30% of the region's industrial development is focused in the Aerotropolis area, um, with experts indicating that this demand is continuing to be strong. In a similar fashion, mixed use category is also inconsistent, but has not been largely used compared to the industrial area, causing a lack of development type balance. And this again goes back to what Jeff was saying, is there's a much larger um, development of industrial compared to mixed use or other development types. Uh, these categories are problematic and spread out, as you can see on these two maps, um, across the region. And what each municipality defines them as um, is, is different. Um, so there's not a, com a, com a cohesive uh, definition for all of these uses. Unfortunately, this causes a variety of issues, including traffic and transportation, environmental and aesthetics. Um, later in the presentation, I think right after me, uh, Daniel Suttard and Aaron Thornson will be discussing freight planning, um, which is an issue in this area. Next slide, please. Key ge geography, excuse me, um, and priority areas were developed each with their own character. Uh, they include the Aerotropolis core, the logistics hub, industrial focus, Fort Gillum, connection to the urban core, Northwest Clayton, Camp Creek Parkway. Uh, and as I discussed earlier, the strengths and weaknesses were outlined in the report, um, but we're not going to get into all those today for time constraints. But again, the report will be in the chat, a link. So what came out of all of this review were two main overarching recommendations. And the first is the need for comprehensive and coordinated action for future industrial development. Um, and the sub areas for this were the resolution of the jurisdictional boundary conflicts, definitions for the different land use types, zoning, 
Oh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, zoning, design, uh, the determination of the location of parking and staging areas, the impact on local infrastructure, which we'll get into a little bit later in the freight planning, and economic impact. Next slide, please. And the second was improved communication and collaboration is important to coordinate jurisdictional plans with Blueprint. Um, and this includes including elected officials, education, and airport planners. Next slide, please. Recommendations focus on collaboration and cooperation is something that went throughout this process. And I'm again showing this slide to illustrate the complexity of the area and the importance, again, of collaboration and cooperation. Next slide, please. In November, we had a virtual half day summit, which was held to review the results of the study and discuss opportunities and challenges and next steps. Uh, we had a variety of participants from a diverse backgrounds attending, including mayors, economic development professionals, and planning professionals. Robert Herrig from the Alliance presented History of Blueprint, which I discussed a little bit here in this presentation. Um, I discussed uh, the land use analysis report, and we had Jeff Kosky, who you just heard from, discuss the fiscal outcomes of the real estate types. Next slide, please. And we also had a wonderful panel discussion on partnerships in development. We had two members of the development community, you can see them here, uh, William Cassidy and, um, and uh, Christy Rooks from Thoughtwell. Uh, we had a zoning attorney, David Kirk, and a site selector, Betty McIntosh. And the main focus in all of their comments was uh, even on different development types and development focused topics was coordination, collaboration, consistency, and rel reliability in development and regulations. Next slide, please. So next steps. Um, next steps are going to be Blueprint 2.0. Um, next slide, yes. Um, so we have at ARC partnered again with the Alliance and we'll be providing $150,000 in EDA CARES Act to fund and assist Blueprint 2.0 using the foundation of the land use study as well as all of the other different planning documents and developments that have come over the last five years. So thank you so much. Um, and I'll take any questions that we have. Thanks, Carrie. And I believe Jared just put a link to the report in thank the you, chat Jared. as well. Um, so please, please take a look at that when you, um, when you, when you have a minute. Uh, and just, just I'll, I'll also just take this moment to say uh, we recognize we're running a little bit late, but we do have, uh, if you all could stick around maybe five, 10 minutes extra, we have a, we have a great presentation to wrap things up, um, but wanted to give at least a minute to see if any other questions were coming in through the chat. So not seeing anything yet, Carrie. Um, but again, I, I think as, as folks get a chance to consume some of this information, please do uh, feel free to reach out to Carrie with questions. And um, it, it is just fitting for us to wrap up this conversation today with uh, our freight study and to talk about that. Because as, as you all have heard, both from Jeff and the work that we did in the Airtropolis area, um, you know, one of the data points we also used uh, was the DRI reviews that we had seen come across our region and the fact that we saw three times the amount of reviews in the warehouse and logistics in 2020 than we did in 2019. And shouldn't be surprising to any of us who have done online shopping more than we have usually done in the last year that that is the case. But uh, part of this whole initiative that we had been working with the Alliance and the communities in the Airtropolis area was to understand how do you balance these different uses, the impacts that they have and how you plan for them. And I think that's a, that's a perfect segue for us to learn a little bit about uh, what our freight study that was completed late last year uh, had to say. And so I am gonna turn it over to maybe Daniel first and then uh, from there we'll, we'll go to Aaron. So Daniel. Thank you, Sam. Um, 
Uh, so uh, as Sam said, my name is Daniel Studdard and I do manage the freight planning program here at ARC. Uh, I've presented in the past on the overall freight cluster plan program, so I didn't want to do that today, but for anyone who's not familiar, uh, our freight cluster plans are intended to address transportation needs uh, and support economic development in areas with significant concentrations of industrial development, which obviously uh, the Aerotropolis is included in that list. Uh, overall, in our region, we have not had a lot of local planning in these areas. Uh, and so this is a this program is really a way to address the needs of these industrial areas. Uh, and while the recommendations to have the freight cluster plans came out of our 2016 regional freight plan, I would argue it's probably more important now than it was then. Uh, and this graph really shows the reason why. Uh, and it's pretty consistent with what Sam just said about DRIs. Uh, what you're looking at here uh, is a presentation from uh, from CoStar uh, showing the amount of industrial construction that was uh, taking place each quarter of the year going back to 2007. Uh, and like I said, it was released uh, back in December, so it's pretty recent. Uh, what you can see is pre-recession, things were going pretty strong. No big surprise that things uh, slowed down significantly during the recession and then for a few years afterwards. By 2014, growth had started up again, and by 2015, it was uh, much higher than pre-recession levels. Plateaued a little bit for a couple years, but still at a very high rate. Then 2018, 19, 20, uh, even increased growth even more. And if you look at those 2020 numbers, you you really see that what's happening, uh, you know, even with COVID uh, happening last year, the, the 2020 under construction numbers were more than double, almost triple, uh, you know, in some quarters, uh, what was happening even pre-recession. So when I say this is more, more relevant now than it was in 2016, I think both in terms of what we're seeing uh, that's under construction, as well as what Sam just said about getting more DRIs uh, for industrial last year than we had in 2019, really shows what's happening in the industrial sector. Uh, and all that then ties directly into transportation. Uh, all this development really results in more trucks on the roads and more transportation impacts. I have to give one caveat to this information. Uh, I would say this almost definitely does not correspond to the 10 county ARC region. Uh, it is probably pretty close to the 20 county ARC region, which is what we follow for the MPO and transportation boundaries. Uh, and even, even if it includes something that's outside of our 20 county area, such as Jackson County, that's okay. This is still very representative of what's happening in our overall region. Uh, that said, I, I do know that there's still a lot of development taking place within the 10 county region and in places like South Fulton, Clayton, Henry County, Douglas County, North Gwinnett. So uh, this is still relevant for what's happening in the 10 county area as well. Uh, next slide, Molly. Uh, so coming up next, uh, we did complete uh, four freight cluster plans from the first round at the end of uh, last year. Um, coming up, we have three more uh, in the works. The Fulton Industrial Boulevard CID and Metro South CID have already kicked off their plans. Uh, and then the city of Atlanta has an RFP upcoming for the northwest part of the city, kind of centering around the M and Yard area. We had good stakeholder involvement for the first round of plans. So certainly uh, anybody who works in, in land use community development, if you work in these areas or adjacent to them, we certainly want you to be a part of this planning process because clearly land use and transportation are linked in these plans. Uh, I mentioned these came out of the 2016 freight plan update. Um, we are about to kick off sometime later this year another update to that. Uh, it's already been five years and it'll take a year or two to complete that plan, plan update. Uh, so if you have any thoughts on that, feel free to reach out to me, you know, let me know now or at any time in the future. Expect an RFP probably in the second quarter of this year. Lastly, I have to mention the Georgia Freight and Logistics Commission. This was created by the state legislature back in 2019. They had numerous meetings, presentations in 2019 and 2020. We expect the potential uh, for a bill to be passed this year. Don't know if one will or not. Don't know exactly what it will cover. Uh, won't just be transportation necessarily. They're certainly looking at workforce needs, looking at truck parking, which is really a land use issue as much as a transportation issue. Uh, so certainly this is something we will be keeping an eye on and you can find a lot more information, previous meeting information at the link uh, that's here on this bullet. Uh, next slide, Molly. Uh, so that wraps up my introduction. I'm gonna hand things off to Erin Thornson. Uh, but um, you know, in her presentation, she's gonna go through the freight cluster plan for the Aerotropolis area. Uh, both a high level analysis as well as uh, go into some detail about a couple of the project recommendations. Uh, that's a little, little bit in the weeds, but I want you to be able to see that because we'll just see how these recommendations might vary a little bit from uh, other planning efforts that we have. Uh, but overall, a lot of these recommendations really deal with safety, which is something I think is certainly relevant for all of us. Uh, and so with that, I will hand things over to Aaron Thornson, uh, Project Manager with Gresham Smith on the Airtropolis Freight Cluster Plan. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel.
Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for um, hanging in with us a little bit longer than uh, the scheduled time. Uh, we appreciate your attention, and I know I see a lot of familiar names out there, so it's good to be with you all uh, virtually this morning. Um, I'm here really representing um, the ATL Airport Community Improvement Districts, um, which are formerly known as the Aerotropolis Atlanta Community Improvement Districts, um, recently rebranding and um, uh, moving forward with this new brand and new name. Um, so I just wanted to take a few minutes to share with you a little bit about our freight cluster plan that we wrapped up at the end of last year, as Daniel mentioned. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the background of the project itself, um, just give you a brief overview of kind of what goes into these freight cluster plans um, and the kind of key tasks that we pursued over the course of this um, project. And then we'll talk a bit about some of the recommendations and our process for prioritizing those projects and um, considerations for funding strategies. Next slide. Um, so as Daniel mentioned, uh, these freight cluster plans uh, originated with the 2016 uh, Regional Freight Mobility Plan update, um, and the Aerotropolis area was identified as one of those regional freight clusters. Um, as we've been discussing all morning, this is uh, an important area in terms of um, being an origin and destination for distribution and, and logistics of goods and movement of freight throughout the area, um, with Hartsfield-Jackson, of course, right at the core of, of this area. Um, but the Atlanta area is also, you know, tied directly to the Port of Savannah, which is currently undergoing expansion. And we've seen, you know, a change in delivery patterns with a significant rise in e-commerce and the use of fulfillment centers and home delivery, especially during the pandemic. Um, and these are all some of the factors that really have um, placed uh, increasing importance um, on freight mobility and the need to invest in projects that will help um, streamline and make freight mobility a little bit safer and a little bit more efficient throughout the area. And you know, with this particular area, as we've also heard through the previous presentations, there's just significant um, development of warehouse and distribution centers. We've got all kinds of, of new um, industrial type development happening throughout this study area. Next slide. So we really focused on kind of the core area that you can see where the hash marks are, the hash lines there in blue and purple at the center of this area right near the airport. And that is the Aerotropolis um, CIDs um, uh, boundaries there. But as you can see, there is a much wider area of influence um, where we've got all kinds of different um, development that is taking place. And all of them are linked through these uh, regional and state uh, truck routes and freight routes. Um, so we really wanted to kind of take a wider view and, and look at this area of influence as well as focus in on specific projects within that core um, Aerotropolis area. Next slide. Um, as part of our study process, working with our steering committee and the project management team, um, we identified several goals that we use to help guide development of this freight cluster plan focused on improving freight operations to maintain economic competitiveness. And as Daniel mentioned, uh, focusing on improving safety and operational, as well as pedestrian enhancements, um, understanding the needs of the uh, freight and industrial workforce as well. Um, we also sought to really facilitate stakeholder engagement and focus on um, engaging folks that are working within the freight and logistics industry, as well as um, local government uh, throughout the study area. And then wanted to um, also emphasize strategic investment planning. So thinking about what kinds of improvements would have kind of the, the biggest bang for their buck and would have good uh, benefits in terms of safety and operations for freight. Next slide. Um, as with all of these freight cluster plans, um, there are several core tasks that are part of the, the study process. Um, we've placed a strong emphasis on our inventory and assessment, um, as well as an intersection level traffic study. Um, we identified 18 intersections throughout the, the core study area and did a more detailed um, traffic analysis at those particular locations. Um, and then also a strong emphasis on developing recommendations. So there was a, a long process of kind of brainstorming potential solutions and thinking about what types of improvements would make sense um, in order to, to come up with a recommended program of, of improvements and projects. Um, all the while we were focused on stakeholder engagement um, and, and working with uh, local organizations and groups to conduct interviews and host um, 
uh, videos, uh, produce videos and host podcasts. Um, we also conducted some um, truck driver surveys. We actually were able to um, directly speak with uh, drivers uh, at a couple of properties throughout the study area. And I also wanted to mention too that we um, coordinated with the Southern Fulton Comprehensive Transportation Plan update, which was happening at the, at the same time as our um, project. So there was a lot of overlap in terms of the geographic area that was covered and the local jurisdictions that were participating in the plan. So unfortunately, we had some overlap between the consulting team with our partners at Modern Mobility Partners, and we were able to kind of leverage the, the simultaneous um, ongoing of those two projects in order to um, benefit both efforts. Next slide, please. So these are just some of the engagement activities you can see there, um, conducting our truck driver survey at the um, Duke Realty campus. Um, we held a freight forum in August um, with stakeholders from GDOT and local governments, as well as uh, representatives from the, the freight industry as well, um, and really got a lot of good input that helped us uh, start to um, narrow down our, our focus on several types of improvements and projects in key areas where we thought they would have the most benefit overall for freight mobility and that economic competitiveness. Next slide, please. Um, I won't get into the details of some of these. Um, as I had mentioned, we did do a detailed inventory and assessment looking at um, the development of warehouse and industrial uh, distribution and logistics space, um, looking at uh, truck volumes on truck routes throughout the study area. And there's, um, as you might expect, given the, the um, projected increases in warehouse space um, coming online over the next couple of years and over the past 10 years too, um, we really are um, poised to see a significant increase in truck traffic along certain key routes, um, including as an example, Camp Creek Parkway. Um, and many of the state routes and truck routes throughout this area have crash rates that exceed the statewide averages for roads of the same functional classification. Um, so those are just a couple of the, the kind of driving factors behind some of our project selection and identification. Next slide, please. Um, working with our partners at Modern Mobility Partners, our team developed a framework for prioritizing projects that takes into account economic benefits um, and kind of a high level return on investment uh, by project types, as well as uh, safety, kind of the project complexity or readiness and the level of effort that it would take to uh, implement projects. Um, as well as mobility benefits. So thinking about um, the ability of projects to uh, reduce vehicle delay, uh, whether they're on designated freight corridors and roads that have high uh, volumes or, or percentages of truck traffic. We also factored in um, public health and environmental benefits, thinking about uh, whether these projects would have the ability to reduce um, anticipated emissions and things like that. So this was kind of the framework, and then we went through a prioritization process, if you can go to the next slide, um, in which we identified metrics for each of those uh, framework categories. And they included kind of a, a range of both qualitative as well as quantitative values. So in some cases, we had low, medium, high types of values, whereas in other cases, we actually identified uh, numeric values and applied those scores to each criteria um, for each project. And then once we had those overall scores, we actually did a weighting, a couple of different weighting scenarios based on stakeholder input from our steering committee and the project management team, as well as the folks who attended that freight forum that we held in August. And we ended up um, using kind of an average of those multiple weighted scenarios in order to um, score all of the projects and develop a tiered prioritized list of projects. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the tier one projects that were identified through that prioritization process. Um, they include a range of intersection improvement projects as well as ITS and technology projects, along with some pedestrian safety and workforce supportive projects. Now you might be surprised to see those kinds of uh, sidewalk type projects in a freight cluster plan, but as I mentioned, um, it was important for us uh, and our committee to think about the, the workforce side of things and access to jobs within the freight um, industry, um, which is always a, a critical problem uh, facing the industry, whether it's uh, driver shortages or people's ability to get to and from their jobs. So the, the pedestrian safety piece was, was a, a big component of what we looked at in terms of some specific project recommendations. On the next slide, um, you'll see 
sort of taking a step back, these are the types uh, and categories of projects that we did come up with as part of our study. Um, there's a, a wide range here, and not only did they include intersection improvements and physical infrastructure projects, but we did look at uh, technology applications, as well as future studies, uh, scoping studies, and uh, feasibility studies. We looked at wayfinding and signage, and also uh, made some recommendations for policies and strategies that could be considered going forward. Next slide. I'll give just a couple of examples of some of our intersection improvement projects here. Um, again, as Daniel mentioned, just to give you a flavor of, of some of the ways in which these types of recommendations um, might be a little bit different than what you would see in some other uh, planning level studies. This intersection here is at Ben Hill Road at Welcome All Road. If you all are familiar with that area, um, there is an at-grade railroad crossing here. And we saw a number of instances of vehicles um, getting uh, stuck on or waiting on the railroad tracks because of the location and proximity of the traffic signal to that at-grade crossing. Um, so here the recommendations actually focus on uh, restriping the west leg of the intersection um, to move that eastbound leg stop bar behind the railroad tracks so that you're not having folks um, stuck waiting on the railroad tracks at a, at a red light. Um, we also are looking at um, pedestrian improvements there. Um, there are some new segments of sidewalk and you have, as you can see in the graphic, um, some bus stops that are present on South Meadow there and wanted to make sure that those sidewalks um, make the connections to the bus stops so that people can actually get into the business park um, that's located in that area. If you go to the next slide, um, we'll go to the Camp Creek Marketplace area. Um, this is another one of uh, the intersections we did a detailed traffic study for. Um, and here, one of the predominant issues that we saw in this location was a pattern of weaving movements where people were leaving uh, Carmia Drive, for example, to the north there of Camp Creek Parkway and, and crossing all the lanes on Camp Creek Parkway to be able to make a, a left on Center Parkway, for example. And so the recommendation here focuses on extending that westbound um, left turn lane and installing some delineator posts to reduce the likelihood of those weaving movements. Um, and then there were also some visibility issues with vegetation kind of blocking um, the view. And there's a, a monument sign on Center Parkway there too that um, limits uh, driver visibility. And by relocating that sign to the, to the side of the road, we'll be able to improve visibility and actually get an, uh, an additional um, turn lane in at that intersection there on Center Parkway. Um, another big piece of the recommendations uh, throughout our study was also looking at signage and directional signage in particular. So you'll notice on, on these um, examples here that we have um, call outs for uh, directional signage. And that was something that we um, kind of noticed throughout the study area, particularly for truck drivers who may not be as familiar with the area. We wanted to make sure that we were thinking about kind of that wayfinding and directional signage pointing to key destinations, intersections, um, and interchanges, particularly on interstate highways. At this intersection here, um, this is Sullivan Road at Old National Highway. Um, and this is a very constrained intersection. It's quite narrow, um, but as you can see, there's a number of industrial um, type uses and we have Amazon uh, uh, Fulfillment Center right nearby. So there's um, you know, a, a strong need to be able to accommodate uh, those larger vehicles. Um, and so this recommendation really focuses on some signal phasing changes um, and widening the, the turn radii there, kind of creating some channelized right turns that can accommodate those trucks. Um, again, installing sidewalks that connect to the existing sidewalks in the area. And then you'll also notice the West Point Avenue intersection is located very close to uh, the old National Highway um, Sullivan Road intersection. So we're looking at uh, recommending either a relocation or um, rerouting of, of traffic from that intersection to the adjacent one that you can't see, but it's just off to the side of the screen there. Um, so just, uh, you know, really focused on kind of trying to make this a bit more accommodating and more efficient for all the freight traffic that does travel through this location. If you go to the next slide. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I just wanted to um, include this slide as a way of showing that our team was really thinking about how to fund and implement these projects. So while a big 
focus of the study was to come up with recommendations that the CIDs and their partners could apply to for TIP funding, for example. Um, we did want to also acknowledge that there's a variety of other um, funding possibilities and pools of, of money that could be available to support some of these projects um, in the future. So we did look at a wide range of possibilities, um, some of which you see here on the screen. Next slide, please. <clears throat> To develop a financially feasible plan recommendations, our team actually projected revenues for the CIDs um, in two different scenarios, looking at kind of a, a status quo revenue generation scenario, as well as um, a more conservative scenario that looked at a significant reduction in potential revenues because of the impacts of the, the pandemic and, and other factors. Um, and ultimately, it was determined that over the course of, of the 10-year um, short-term timeline for this, um, the, the CIDs would have available a total of about 16 million in revenue that could potentially be allocated to these types of projects. Um, and then what we did from there was, was allocate those dollars to projects over time and match them with what we anticipate would be local match contributions from the partner jurisdictions, whether the cities or the counties in which these projects are located. So ultimately it was determined that um, the, the majority of the projects, the vast majority in fact, would be able to be initiated within the 10 year short term timeline um, following the completion of this project. If you go to the next slide. We also wanted to think about some of the kind of low hanging fruit and early wins that could come out as immediate um, sort of action steps following the completion of this project. So understanding that it will take time to secure funding and program some of these projects and move forward with some of the design um, phases for the infrastructure projects. We also wanted to be thinking about uh, ways that the CIDs and their partners can um, work with initiatives that are already underway and ongoing, like the Regional Connected Vehicle program um, and others to um, you know prioritize uh, small improvements uh, that are not extremely costly that will have some significant benefit for freight mobility throughout the area. So these are just a couple of examples here um, and there's more details um, in the full report. And with that, uh, we'll uh, wrap everything up. There's contact information here for Crystal Harris, who is the uh, program director for the CIDs. Um, it was our project manager for this study. Um, and I know she had a, a schedule conflict and is not able to be here today, but um, she would be the go-to person with any kind of follow-up questions. Although I'm happy to take any questions here today as well. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, so I'm gonna look at the chat real quick. Uh, to see if there's any questions. By the way, fascinating information. And I'm glad you did show some of the details because it does go to show that how you go from the macro to, to, to the intersection level detail within the same plan and how critical that is for this work. So um, don't, don't see any questions coming in yet, but I did have something that I was hoping um, you, could, you could talk a little bit about is during the course of the work that we did on the land use side of it, we did hear as some of this residential growth is occurring in these communities, uh, and as we're seeing a, an explosion in um, sort of the warehouse and distribution space, there, there's bound to be uh, some conflicts that arise mm -hmm. as a result of that. And uh, I know that was not 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 the uh, core one of the core areas that that the study was. Uh, set out to accomplish, but was wondering even from the safety and from the circulation standpoint, because what we heard often was there's a lot of truck traffic that we're not getting to see in our local streets. And they're, you know, they're, they're uh, sort of breaking up our curbs. They're sort of destroying the, some of these local intersections. Just wondering if that came up during some of the discussions or if that is something that you've seen in other studies. Um, it, it very much did come up in our discussions as part of this um, project. And in fact, uh, Carrie and I spoke a couple times about some of the kind of land use considerations and it um, that you know we were looking at as part of this study. And one of the patterns that we noticed is is many of the planned um, DRIs and the uh, warehouses that are coming online are encroaching farther and farther out into new kind of greenfield development and some of the more almost um, suburban and residential kinds of areas, particularly out the South Fulton Parkway um, heading west. And those 
you know, those uh, do present some, some conflicts then because at some point uh, the, the vehicles do need to get to those distribution centers and need to have access to them. And some of those roads, you know, may or may not be equipped to really handle those larger type vehicles. Um, so that is definitely something that, that we heard and we tried to take into consideration as we thought about some of the, the configuration and the geometry of those intersections um, leading out to some of those areas. Um, there were a couple of, of specific projects that we looked at um, that, that were in areas where there was maybe a truck prohibition on, on one road and trucks were supposed to make a turn, but often they don't make that turn. And we had heard complaints about the trucks traveling you know, further down that uh, more residential kind of character area. So tried to offer some recommendations there that would um, help reinforce that sort of um, more residential character of those intersections through um, curb expansions and some signage and things that would really make improvements to that area and kind of indicate to drivers that this is really not, you know, although you could go that way, it's, you know, there's, there is a designated truck route that if you make this left turn, that's the direction you should be headed. Okay. All right. Daniel, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll just chime in and say, um, you know, we, this is certainly something that comes up in most counties in our region, to be honest. And um, uh, one of the strategies is certainly to try to, you know, do what Aaron said and, and improve signage and things like that, but also looking at the areas where there may be bottlenecks as, as Aaron kind of walked through a couple locations, but certainly there's more in, in this plan and all the freight cluster plans. Um, you know, part of what happens is that the truck drivers are frustrated. They know there's a choke point and they don't want to sit in that traffic. And so they find another way. It may not be the way you want them to go, but they're, they're like everybody else. They don't want to sit in traffic and typically are getting paid by the mile. And so when they're sitting, there not moving, they're not getting paid. And so they're, uh, you know, they have a lot of constraints on them, hours of service requirements, uh, you know, appointments that they get penalized if they're late for. And so they're dealing with all that and they're just looking to, to get paid and to get moving as quickly as they can. And so sometimes they look at for other routes. And so if we can address some of these choke points and, you know, we may not fully resolve the, the traffic congestion, but if we can make it uh, more manageable, especially these first mile, last mile type of uh, locations and, and, you know, like Aaron showed there at Camp Creek Parkway, um, you know, you've got massive amount of retail on one side of the road. It's actually a lot of industrial on the other side of the road. And there's a lot of cut through traffic coming from Fulton Industrial Boulevard that takes that to get to Camp Creek Parkway. So if we can solve some of these, you know, safety related issues, reduce crashes that in turn are, are what may cause a bottleneck beyond just the standard congestion, that can help keep the truckers on uh, the roads that we would prefer them to be on. Um, and, and so that's kind of some of the strategies that we're looking at. That said, we, we do see instances where, um, you know, both in this study area sometimes and, and other parts of the region, where we will see an industrial development essentially right next to a single family residential development. Um, and, you know, that's that's kind of a zoning issue that, that once it gets built, there's no good way to address it. Uh, it's something we see in the plans and, and people complain about it and, and rightfully so. Uh, and I talk to people who work in industrial and they say, I understand why the residents are mad. I wouldn't want to live next to our business either, uh, you know, and so, those where you know you can do certain things on transportation, but certainly if we can manage it before the development gets built, um, you know, and, and have some buffer with other uses between residential and industrial, that's certainly a positive thing as well. Okay, thanks, Danielle. Thanks, Aaron. And I know we're on time, but I do have one last question, which I did want to sort of get your thoughts on, which is, you you did mention uh, around the uh, the loading and the the staging areas and the parking. And was curious to see how that conversation went because as we've we worked in some of these jurisdictions, there's this jurisdiction by jurisdiction decision making of where the parking and where the loading areas are going to be, and wanted to see how that plays into sort of a a sub regional discussion and how that gets coordinated if that gets coordinated um, better. So. Yeah, I mean, it is a, a certainly as you mentioned, it's a it's an issue that each community is, is grappling with, um, and I think everybody has a slightly different approach to it right now. Um, and in a lot of cases, it has to do with, um, you know, the the um, requirements or the regulations of the the distribution facilities or the stores themselves. Some of the retail locations, you know, different companies have different regulations about what they will allow in terms of, uh, you know. Uh, picking up and dropping off of, of um, you know, their loads and whether, you know, trucks, for example, are allowed to, um, you know, stage or park overnight, for example, and some retailers won't allow that, whereas others, you know, might um, accommodate that. 
So there's there's a number of different you know factors that play into it. Um, as far as any kind of you know regional coordinated or multi-jurisdictional coordinated strategy, that was not something we necessarily explored. Um, I think there is a need for it, and that's certainly something that we acknowledged in our in our plan. And I think you know we have to recognize that that um, if if one jurisdiction you know prohibits um, trucks from parking on any streets, or if there's no provision for for parking. Um, you know, in that particular area, then it's going to potentially push that out into neighboring jurisdictions. Um, so there is really a need for, for a more coordinated approach. And as Daniel can speak to, you know, the lack of truck parking in the metro area is a significant issue. And um, it's something that, um, you know, a lot of different jurisdictions are, are trying to kind of wrap their heads around. And that may be something, um, Daniel, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit, but I think it's something that, um, across the different freight cluster plans, uh, you know, coming out of these studies, there may be uh, an opportunity to kind of come up with some kind of more best practice types of solutions uh, rather than leaving each community to, you know, to kind of figure it out on their own. Yeah, uh, truck parking, it, it's a big issue nationally as well as it is in, in sure. Metro Atlanta, and it, it kind of keeps getting worse to a certain extent because we keep having more industrial growth, more trucks on the road, uh, but not necessarily as many new truck parking spaces. Uh, the challenge is that it, it largely comes down to a local land use issue, uh, and most jurisdictions don't want truck parking. Um, you know, it's nobody wants to live near it. Uh, you know, it's it's not a, a best use in you know most places. Um, even compared to other industrial, it's it's not going to bring in the same amount of tax revenue typically. Uh, and so it's it's something that um, you know most jurisdictions would rather let somebody else worry about it. Uh, but the problem is when you do that. The truckers still need somewhere to park. They have hours of service requirements from the federal government, uh, and there's penalties with if they are exceeding that and get caught. Uh, and those penalties are worse than if they park on your local street uh, and maybe the cops tell them to move or, or give them a ticket at worst. So, uh, you know, their decision making process is, you know, I could have impacts to my, my CDL, my commercial driver's license, or I can risk a ticket or, you know, a cop telling me to move. And, and so it's logical that they're they're parking on a city street or they're parking in uh, an office development or retail development that doesn't want them parking there. We, we definitely get complaints, uh, you know, from big box retailers, from office developments, because truckers are parking there overnight because they, they don't have anywhere else to go, to put it bluntly. There's, there's not enough spaces to accommodate all of them. And so it's, it's one of those, you can ignore it and hope it doesn't impact you, but we're seeing more and more of these impacts. Uh, and so it, it, it really is something that if we, we keep ignoring it, it, it really needs to be addressed uh, more broadly. Uh, most of the parking is on the south and west side of our region, uh, without a doubt. Uh, admittedly, that's where the majority of the industrial development is, but certainly there's demands throughout the entire region, both for industrial development uh, and because we have so much retail on the north side in particular. So uh, it's a challenge. You know, it's it's not something ARC can push on, on any jurisdiction. It's something that uh, it really, you know, it, it's key infrastructure. If you, if you want the industrial development and the tax revenue, I think that's a key part to make it happen. Uh, in, in a smart way, but it's not uh, necessarily always happening uh, everywhere throughout, throughout our region. Right. And no, I would just quickly add to that, that I think one of the things, you know, that we explored a little bit as part of this study was how to, how to think about that a little bit more proactively and encourage these developments as they come online to plan ahead for that and to, you know, think about requirements for accommodating some capacity of, of overnight parking or truck parking on a short-term basis um, in order to, um, reduce the likelihood of those kinds of issues because it's difficult to retrofit the existing parking lots and facilities that may not be able to support the weight of all those vehicles, for example. So to the extent that as new development comes online, if provisions can be made for accommodating that before they're built, then that's probably one of the better strategies to think about going forward. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. If that's something that can be put into uh, local zoning requirements or DRI requirements, that's certainly a good thing. But um, unfortunately, most developers aren't going to do that proactively because they don't make money off of it. Uh, is, is you know they pretty bluntly told me that. And so uh, you know that's you have the developer that's doing one thing. One company operates the warehouse. A different company is providing the trucks. And so everybody has their own individual interests, and those are not always aligned. Uh, and so that's kind of where we get into these challenges. Absolutely. Well, well, thanks again. And, and, you know, I brought that up more because one of the things we, we, we sort of try to address in the work that we did with the land use study was around that there is, um, their tropolis area is, has the largest amount of undeveloped land and green space in our region. And as we're working 
to preserve that, um, what, what we're trying to help jurisdictions figure out is how do they not make individual decisions to create new parking and paving areas, which is taking away from the green space um, and, and are able to do it in a way that they're able to leverage, like you all said, existing parking lots or mall parking lots and, and do that in, in, in a coordinated way if it makes sense. So, but, but completely hear what you're saying. So um, I know we're, we've gone way over, but again, it was fascinating to hear from both of you. So thank you for doing that. Uh, uh, it, I don't know if there's, uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, Molly, is there anything else that we need to be doing before I close? I think maybe just um, letting everyone know that our CDAP and LCI application deadline is tomorrow. Great, and you just did that. So, yep. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, folks, hopefully you got to know a little bit more about the work that we're doing in the Atropolis region. Again, I'll, I'll say from our end as the ARC, we have dedicated, you know, whatever resources we have at our disposal be it through the LCI program, be it through the Community Development Assistance Program, uh, through our uh, you know freight studies planning program, and and so and some of the infrastructure investments, and through the EDA uh, hat that that we wear as well. So we'll continue to push forward for that, in in our work in the future. Um, and again, if you have any questions about any of the presentations today, please feel free to reach out to the speakers. Uh, and we'll be following up with an email. So thanks for joining us. You all have a great rest of the day. Hopefully you get out for a little bit today while the weather's still warm. So thank you everyone.